So for those who don't know, I think I do see a lot of new faces on this call, which is very exciting. But Create Peace Now is a campaign that was founded in 2019 to educate, organize, and advocate for an end to the ongoing Korean War and establish peace on the Korean Peninsula. This grassroots-based network, which is now over uh, 500 members all across the country, includes multi-generational Korean Americans, humanitarian workers, faith leaders, anti-war activists, all working together to advocate for the 70-plus ongoing Korean War. We work on advocacy, political education, narrative change, organizing, coalition building. And as you can see, we are a diverse group here, um, but we are held together by principles of envisioning a world where everyone can flourish in an environment of peace, hope, dignity, collective well-being. We mobilize collective action grounded in intersectional feminism to end the Korean War, democratize U.S. foreign policy, contribute to lasting peace across the Asia Pacific and the world. So thank you, Solby, for that link. If you'd like to get more updates, our email newsletter, join the Grassroots Network, please sign up there. So this year, Create Peace Now decided to launch the Intergenerational Healing and Learning Series. Although often referred to as the Forgotten the War, the Korean War inaugurated, in fact, the U.S. military industrial complex, quadrupled U.S. military spending, and was one of the most, if not as some scholars say, the most brutal war of the 20th century with more than 4 million killed in just three years, mostly civilians. Uh, and this conflict continues, even though it is called a forgotten war, with 70 years of a fragile ceasefire being signed, but keeps Korean families separated and drives extreme militarization of the Korean Peninsula and the whole entire Asia Pacific. This ongoing war and militarism impacts Korean war survivors, veterans, their descendants, and all sectors of society, which is why we are here tonight. And we also know that this near trillion dollar military budget and endless war spending wreaks havoc abroad and here at home. So we launched this online educational series featuring activists, artists, and scholars to understand the intergenerational trauma stemming from the Korean War and other U.S. forever wars. Our speakers have highlighted how intergenerational healing bolsters uh, efforts to end the ongoing Korean War, and we have discussed how the fate of the Korean War is inextricably intertwined with all movements seeking to end U.S. wars and militarism globally. You can find the recordings of our past two gatherings on our YouTube channel. Uh, I highly recommend taking a look after today's event. So we know that these topics can sometimes bring up heavy emotions, and we are a group primarily dedicated to advocacy and activism, but we thought that this conversation is really important to have as it often comes up as we are undertaking this work. So tonight we urge folks to take care of yourselves as always, um, feel free to leave the breakout rooms, take breaks as needed, and just in general, practice good, you know, organizing community etiquette around making space for others, practicing generosity in your listening and learning and acknowledging that we all come from different experiences and backgrounds. So without further ado, I will be introducing Grace and Iris, just very brief introductions um, before we move into the readings. Their full bios are online. Grace Cho is the author of award-winning work, Taste Like War. Her first book, which I have right here, <laughs> um, her first book, Haunting the Korean Diaspora, Shame, Secrecy, and the Forgotten War received the 2010 Book Award from the American Sociological Association. She is also the Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at the College of Staten Island, CUNY. We're so great, grateful to have Grace with us tonight. Iris Kim, Iris Yoon Kim, is a 2024 NBCU Academy, Academy Storyteller and 2022 Emerging Voices Fellow. Her work has been anthologized in Woodhall Press's Non-White and Women in September 2022. She was also part of our 30 under 30 cohort that attended the 2023 Korea Peace Action National Mobilization in Washington, D.C. on the 70th anniversary of the armistice and is currently working in a collection of essays about the reverberations of immigration assimilation within Korean American communities. Okay, I talked enough, so I will now turn over to Iris to start with um, your reading. Go ahead, Iris. Thank you, Kathy, for that introduction. It's so wonderful to be here with friends on the screen and other KPN members. Um, and of course, I'm honored to share the space with Grace, whose work has significantly shifted the questions that I ask in my own memoirs and essays. Um, today, I'll read a brief excerpt from an essay that I recently published in a magazine called Briar Patch, which is titled, Are You North or South Korean? North or South? Most Koreans in the diaspora get asked this question at least once. 
I've often been asked right after a stranger discovers I'm Korean. I'm South Korean, I've answered dozens of times. The question asker oohs and ahs and follows with a well-intentioned reply. My daughter loves K-pop. I love Korean dramas. I want to go to Seoul one day. I know that this is a question I'll never escape, not while the peninsula remains divided. But when I answer South and the question asker responds positively, I think of my North Korean kin and the response I might get if I answered North. As I talk about Korean music and TV, I can't help but feel like I'm disavowing half my people and homeland. Answering this question has always been uncomfortable. I remember the first time I was asked, are you from North Korea? It was in gym class in fifth grade, five years after I'd moved to the United States. I was fluent in English by then and a loud, bossy girl on the student council. To keep up my reputation, I knew my answer had to ooze confidence. I rolled my eyes and smirked, ew, what? Of course not, drawing out the O sounds in my valley girl accent. I didn't know much about North Korea, but my instincts told me I had to distinguish myself from those bad, weird Koreans. An emphatic no was the only acceptable answer. Growing up, my knowledge of Korean history in North Korea was very limited. I didn't know any North Koreans except for those I saw on the news. I knew that Korea was split in two and that the North was ruled by a dictator who wore drab gray suits and lived in a sprawling palace. But I didn't know why the Korean people were divided, why we had different governments or why I hadn't met any North Koreans. My grandparents were born in the final years of Japan's 35 year occupation of Korea. Immediately following liberation from Japanese rule in 1945, one half of the people were instructed to hate the other half by the Soviet Union and the US, turning parent against child, teacher against student, and friend against friend. To my grandparents, a divided Korea felt inevitable. They did not even long for reunification because they, like most people in the country, were just trying not to starve during and after the Korean War. The next generation, my parents, grew up performing military drills to prepare for a looming North Korean attack. In middle school, my mother learned to administer first aid and my father how to assemble and disassemble rifles. When the monthly test air raid sirens went off during the school day, students hurried to crouch under their desks. If they were at home, they knew to draw the curtains tightly so no light would escape into the night and lead police to pound on their doors. After college, my father started his compulsory military service, which was reduced from two years to three months because he's an engineer. As, a newly, militarized, as newly militarized subjects, they followed the South Korean and U.S. government's orders. The North, formerly our kin, became a fearsome enemy. These ideas were then passed on to me during my early years in Seoul and reinforced by Western media after I moved to the U.S. How would I answer the question, are you North or South Korean now? The narrative I was sold about my own people and the U.S., North Korea as the axis of evil and America as benevolent savior, no longer stands. I can no longer answer South Korean like I used to. My grandparents, who are old enough to remember a single Korea, shake their heads in resignation when I speak of reunification. Unlike my grandparents, perhaps because I cannot remember what they know, I now organize towards permanent peace on the peninsula. I fall asleep at night, dreaming of our people joining hands at the 30th parallel and being whole once again. I now have a different answer, one that feels truer to me. I'm neither from the North or South. I am Korean. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. It's so wonderful to see all the emojis. Please feel use the emoji reactions liberally and freely in this space. Thank you. Um, I will just turn it straight on over to you, Grace, um, who I believe will be reading excerpts from Taste Like War tonight. Thank you so much. Oh, Iris, I have um, goosebumps actually listening to that because I think it, it your piece does such a good job of showing how uh, children are taught how to forget and how we then, you know, as adults have to spend our lives trying to sort of excavate through all those layers of of forgetting. Um, yeah, thank you all for being here and for the invitation. I'm going to read a few different excerpts from Taste Like War. And if you haven't read the book, I'll just give you just the briefest synopsis. Uh, I describe it as partly a food memoir, partly a sociological investigation into the social roots of my mother's schizophrenia. Um, and one of those roots, of course, is the Korean War. Um, okay, and so uh, for the last 10 years of my mom's life, I cooked for her. And so, um, you know, the trajectory of those 10 years went from her refusing food to eventually asking me 
to cook the Korean dishes that my grandmother used to cook for her. So this first scene is set, uh, you know, right when she moves into an apartment on her uh, of her own above my brother's garage. Um, but at this time, she was not yet eating. My brother and his wife seemed to think that things would improve once my mother had a place of her own. I suppose it was a reasonable assumption. During the first few months, she still didn't want to eat. They tried some of the same tricks I'd resorted to when she was at my place in Queens, like leaving food for her in the hopes she'd eat it, knowing how much she hated for things to go to waste. They also stocked her pint-sized kitchen with large quantities of packaged foods that required no more preparation than adding water or opening a can. According to my sister-in-law, my mother was eating the ramen and fruit cocktail, but had barely touched the powdered milk. Although I felt some relief knowing that she wasn't starving, I also felt ashamed that her diet was so bereft of nutrition. Mom, are you getting enough to eat? I asked. She nodded. What about protein? She nodded again, then snorted. They got me powdered milk. Oh yeah? I said, feigning surprise. She became quiet as if she had already lost her train of thought and was deep in some hallucinatory reverie. I can't stand the taste of it, she said. Tastes like war. It was only the second time she ever brought up the war without my prompting. Her words jolted me into a reverie of my own as fragments of my research tumbled around in my head. Images of babies sitting on dirt roads next to the bodies of their dead mothers and napalmed women bandaged like mummies. The words of a woman who survived the Nogani massacre, who lost her child when American planes dropped bombs from above. That day I saw the two faces of America. The words of a war bride who remembered American food aid. I had heard of the Yankees and how they were here to save us. We were all hoping for rice or barley and we drooled at the thought of so much food, but it was an endless supply of powdered milk that caused all who drank it to suffer for days with diarrhea. In February, 2002, my mother finally went to the hospital after my brother and sister-in-law called an ambulance and had her admitted on the grounds that she was trying to starve herself to death. She started meds again started to eat again, but still not much, not everything. Her resistance still took the form of rejecting food, but the foods she couldn't or wouldn't eat were very specific, like the powdered milk. After Arnold Schwarzenegger was elected as California's governor, she asked me to stop buying her Arnold bread. Mom, you know it has nothing to do with him, right? The name is just a coincidence. She smiled and let out a little laugh as if she knew how crazy it sounded. She always seemed to put a great deal of thought into her choices to eat or not eat something. In time, I recognized these choices as an expression of agency, tiny acts of rebellion against enormous structures of power. So I'm going to read from another chapter, but just a comment on that one is that, you know, one of the things that I hope to do there and throughout the book is to sort of challenge this idea that the voices that someone hears um, are just a symptom of a broken brain, that maybe they have something to teach us. And that in the, you know, in the case of my relationship to my mom, um, observing her voice is sort of you know, those were clues that led me to my family history and to Korean history more broadly. Um, and so I'll be reading a couple of different excerpts from a chapter called January 7th. At certain times each day, my mother would chant something that my sister-in-law referred to as the timing thing. At 107, she repeated January 7th my birthday, over and over again with the speed of an auctioneer until the minute was up. January 7th, January 7th, January 7th, January 7th, January 7th, January 7th, January 7th. She did the same for my brothers, 
but there was another time date I didn't recognize, 9.45. She did not repeat it in the same way, but said it only once every 12 hours. I was frightened the first time I witnessed it because we had been in the middle of a mundane conversation and suddenly she straightened her posture, pointed to the clock with one firm shake of her right index finger and announced in a loud arresting voice, September 45. And then as if nothing had happened, she returned her attention back to me and finished her previous thought exactly where it had left off. I was always spooked by it, much more so than any of her other quirks. It didn't feel like these words and actions had just been generated by her mind, but rather that there was some other presence in the room, a supernatural force that was using her body to speak. The layers of meaning behind the timing thing would begin to unfold that year and for years to come. In September, 1945, the United States occupied the southern half of the Korean Peninsula, where they would establish a new nation called South Korea with a hand-picked Harvard-educated president, lay the groundwork for a laboratory in which new weapons of mass destruction would be tested on communists and groups of refugees that might be harboring them, build an infrastructure for entertaining the American troops that would remain there to this day. In every memory I have of my mother's first months on the East Coast, I am cold, chilled in her underheated apartment, shivering in the driveway as my sister-in-law stops me from leaving so she can tell me something important. Her words like incendiary bomblets scattered over my psyche, sometimes exploding long after impact. Grace, your mom is doing this thing, this panicking thing. Grace, your mom is getting worse. Grace, your mom, there's something I need to tell you. The day before New Year's Eve, she dropped the big bomb, its devastation swift and brutal. I had been staying with my mother over the holidays and was on my way to meet Sandra and Jaquetta at a mall in Philadelphia when my sister-in-law pulled up. She got out of her cream-colored station wagon and began unloading a delivery of groceries. She had taken on this responsibility of shopping for my mother while also caring for my infant niece. In retrospect, I see how the stress of a baby and my mother, two new arrivals with completely different needs, must have worn her to the bone. Are you leaving already? She asked. I'm just going shopping for a New Year's Eve outfit, but I'll be back in a few hours. Her face showed the strain of sleepless nights. Grace, your mom, there's something I need to tell you. What now? I was feeling stressed by all her pronouncements, though I couldn't articulate exactly why, only that it made my helplessness in the face of my mother's illness all the more painful. What new development could have caused my sister-in-law to hesitate like that? Why the preface when she usually just spat out the words? There was nothing she could say about my mother's condition that would have come as a shock to me. I had already been through eight years of erratic behaviors, mood swings, and hallucinations. What could she possibly tell me that I didn't already know? Grace, your mother used to be a prostitute. What is she talking about? My skin turned hot, barely able to contain the feelings of confusion bubbling beneath it. How do you know that? I can't remember if I actually vocalized this question, but she answered it nonetheless. Look, your brother remembers it. Go ask him. He remembers when she used to get dressed up. Dressed up. The clothing, a metonym for the profession. My memory flickered with scenes of Halloween 1984 when Jenny and I had made a last minute decision to go trick or treating. Let's dress up as hookers, one of us said. We were 13 year old girls beginning to explore our sexuality and prostitutes were the only women we knew who had the freedom to be overtly sexual. We hastily got dressed, caked on makeup, teased hair, mini skirts and fishnet tights that we had bought at Spencer's. As I was about to walk out that night, my mother blocked the doorway with her body and glared at me. What do you think you're supposed to be, huh? Her scornful tone stung and I feared that at any moment she might uncross her arms and slap me. 
My voice was meek, but I answered quickly, a punk rocker. Even then I knew that she would kill me before she let me be a prostitute. Of course she had wanted to stop me. I was glamorizing the very life that she had escaped and had tried to bury. But how could that be? How could that have been her life? My head started to spin and I leaned against the open door of my car to hold myself up as my sister-in-law continued to talk. He never told you because he wanted to spare you, but now you need to know your mom's getting worse. Spare me. I wasn't sure if I was more disturbed by my mother's past or the fact that it had been kept a secret from, from me my whole life. Why was I the last to know? And then I would twist my face up to hold in the tears and my sister-in-law would try to console me by saying that it hadn't been that bad. It was one of the nicer clubs. It wasn't like she was on the streets. On January 7, 2009, the New York Times ran a story about a group of former sex workers breaking a decades-long silence about the South Korean government's role in setting up a sex trade for the Americans. Our government was one big pimp for the US military, one of them said. The number of women speaking out would grow and eventually 120 of them would file a lawsuit against the South Korean government for enabling systematic abuse against thousands of women and girls. It would take eight years, but a panel of three judges would rule in favor of 57 of the plaintiffs, workers who had serviced the US military in the 1960s and 1970s, the same time period in which my mother worked on the base. The court determined that the government had illegally detained the women by locking them up in rooms with barred windows and forcing them to undergo medical treatment for sexually transmitted infections, constituting what one judge described as a serious human rights violation that should never have happened and should never be repeated. According to Pak Yunja, one of the plaintiffs mentioned in the article, they never sent us to doctors, even when we were so sick we almost died, except they treated us for venereal diseases, not for us, but for the American soldiers. Park also challenged the popular notion that she and her fellow sex workers at the military bases were quote unquote, willing prostitutes. She pointed out that some women had been tricked by job placement agencies, but even those who knew what kind of work they'd be getting into had never consented to the abusive conditions. I was only a teenager and I had to receive five GIs a day with no day off. When I ran away, they caught and beat me raising my debt. The plaintiffs would later file a lawsuit against the US government. I heard my mother's voice chanting as I read the article from the New York Times, January 7th, January 7th, January 7th. I had always thought it was in reference to my birthday, but then I wondered if the date was also her vision into the future, the voice of her solidarity with the plaintiffs. So after the book was published, a year after, uh, about a year and a half after the book was published, then the um, South Korean Supreme Court um, made a ruling um, in favor of the plaintiffs again, and this time explicitly naming the South Korean government as having set up the system and um, being responsible for the abusive conditions of these women. Okay, so I'll... Uh, yeah, I have time for one more short one. And this is this is one that's more about food. And so when we think about like uh, about intergenerational healing, I think that this one speaks to that because of the experience of cooking for my mom over the course of these 10 years and sharing all these meals with her uh, for me was a really healing experience. You know, um, it, one could argue that maybe it was healing for her, but I think that more importantly, it was it healed something in the relationship between the two of us. And um, you know, she used to always ask me to to cook certain dishes for her. But before she got to the point where she would request things, I would just sort of um, you know like pick something randomly that I thought she might like. By the time I finally learned to listen to my mother's cravings, she stopped making me guess what she wanted. 
She made regular requests for Korean dishes she hadn't eaten for ages, like jang jorim, beef and spicy green peppers stewed in soy sauce, or chap sal dog, a sweet red bean rice cake. The flavors transported me back to my childhood, to my first mother's embrace. Though it took years for me to fully absorb the significance of these meals, it was seng te that would make me understand that feeding her had the effect of gently releasing the past. It was a dish that I had never tasted or heard of before, but I cooked it as per my mother's instructions. Saute radishes and sesame oil until they begin to soften. Don't be ashamed to use sesame oil. Put in garlic, plenty of garlic. Now don't be ashamed to use that either. Her recipes were like incantations against a history of being rendered inferior. Add fish, dashi broth, scallions, gukkanjang, and gochugaru. Bring to a low boil and serve with rice. We sat down on the floor around the glass top coffee table to eat the fragrant fish stew. And I contemplated the balance of flavors, spicy, smoky, pungent, and sweet. I haven't tasted this in 40 years, she said. Her voice was soft, dreamy. Wow, it's so good. How come you never made this when I was little? I guess I just never craved for it until now. That was always her answer when I asked why we were eating something now, but not then. What was it about the now that stirred up her cravings? Does it taste the same as when you used to cook it? I never cooked it, she said between slurps of garlicky broth. Really? How did you know how to make it? It's how I remember my mother making. I couldn't believe that she had successfully taught me how to make such a delicious dish based on a 40-year-old recollection of watching someone else cook it. Throughout her life, Sengte Jige was something that others cooked for her, the most comforting of comfort foods. The recipe, the memory of her mother's hands, had been lying dormant on her tongue for all those years. Tasting it must have been a kind of homecoming. The experience of awakening her memories moved me so much that Sengte Jige became a family treasure, something that I didn't want to cook too often so as to not diminish its importance. I made it only when she specifically asked for it. After one such request, I heard from my sister-in-law that she had been thinking about it all week long. Are you making your mom that fish stew? She keeps talking about it as she's really looking forward to it. Our Korean dinners became beacons around which her uneventful life was structured. From the moment I walked out the door, the countdown to the next meal would begin. That Monday, when I returned to the graduate center, Hosu and her girlfriend asked me what I had cooked for my mother over the weekend. They would always take delight in hearing about our dinners, but this time, as soon as I told them it was Sengtechige, they screeched, laughing so hard they doubled over. What's so funny? I asked. Nobody from our generation makes that, Hosu said, breathless from laughing. Thank you. Thank you, Grace, for your reading. Um, I've only ever read the physical copy of your memoir, so to hear you read it out loud brought up a whole new set of emotions. Um, in particular, I remember gasping when I read your mother's comment about powdered milk and how it tasted like war to her. Um, my grandfather actually also ran an import-export business at the Itaewon base for the U.S. military. And so he used to say the same thing about spam, that it reminded him of Americans. Um, and as I prepared for this talk, I thought um, about why I write memoir and realized that I'm primarily driven by these never-ending questions and stories that I want to uncover about my family. Uh, most of my writing, you know, usually tends to focus on cultural and generational differences within my family and requires that I explore these multiple realities. And I have to remind myself that what my parents and my grandparents have lived through are completely different political, economic, and societal shifts. Um, and for example, my grandma read the essay that I just read aloud for you all, and she responded that she's glad that she read it, but that I had a far away distant view of the Korean War 
and she doesn't necessarily agree with me on everything, but I use writing as a way to bring us closer to understanding one another. Um, so now I want to turn it to some questions uh, that I have for you. And the first one is, is broad. Um, why do you write? Yeah, well, so the, the, the excerpt that I read from the, the, you know, the second excerpt, this discovery, so I was 23 at the time, or it was a week before my 23rd birthday when I learned that my mom had been a sex worker for the US military. And I think that was sort of when my writing life seriously began. Um, and I, I often will cite um, Bell Hook's theory as liberatory practice. It opens with the line, I came to theory because I was hurting, because the pain inside me was so intense, I couldn't go on living. And so, you know, she then she talks about like how, how theorizing, and particularly feminist theory, was a way of making sense of the world and naming the pain. Um, and so that that's sort of what started all of it. And then I, you know, I continue to write because I'm sort of driven, you know, similar to what you were saying, driven to understand some something about my family history that has been hidden by all of these different forces um and so it just sort of like you know i find that there's no end to it <laughs> that you know i'm now on my my third book that's related to the korean war and family history and it has <clears throat> sort of consumed my whole adult life yeah thank you and you mentioned that um, you mentioned liberation, and I wanted to touch on liber on the liberation that writing can bring, especially when you shine a light on places of darkness and shame. And um, there's a moment in your memoir where your mother finds out that your first book is about to be published, uh, Haunting of the Korean Diaspora, and you ask for her permission to tell her story. And after hesitating a bit, she does give permission. And reading that scene, I felt a sense of um, a profound release of collective shame, not just from you and your mother in that moment, but also uh, a release from shame from myself as a reader. Um, and so my question is, what do you think writing both your books meant for the possibility of liberation from shame for your mother, yourself, for, for yourself and for readers like us? Mm. Well, so in my first book, I sort of centered it around this theoretical idea by these two psychoanalyst, psychoanalysts, um, Abraham and Torek, and the idea was uh, called transgenerational haunting. And it says that, you know, one generation's secrets, the things that they cannot speak, become ghosts that then live in the unconscious of the next generation. And so that we, you know, like being of that generation, uh, the second generation after the war and like sort of unconsciously carrying all these secrets, um, you know, I sort of like really, I, I really related to that theory. And, you know, th their conclusion is that the way that you sort of release the grip of the ghost so that it's not a destructive force is through something they call a staging of words where you take that shameful secret and you put it into the into the public sphere right and so you, you so you know there is a sort of release in that sense of the shame um but i think it's also a, a, a way of communicating with an audience who may have may be feeling the same thing you know because i think that i i don't know that i'm always so conscious of who my audience is when i write but I do always think of other Korean diasporic people who have had similar experiences um, and may or may not have been able to sort of release their ghosts in a similar way through their words. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it's an act of communication in that way. And I think that 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 scene that you mentioned was kind of it's kind of interesting to think about that because um, I felt that conversation between me and my mom was, it, it was very non-threatening in a lot of ways because I had so much anxiety and guilt about writing about her when I was working on my dissertation be, with my first book before, you know, before it was my first book. And um, I kept waiting for her to ask me what I was writing about, what I was studying in grad school. And she never did. I kept waiting for that opportunity to sort of break the silence around, you know, uh, the way that I was just really interested in understanding her life conditions. But she had heard about the book from someone else in my family. 
And so when I walked into her apartment that day, she said, Grace, are you writing a book? And she didn't seem angry. She just see it was just like an invitation to talk about it because I think she already knew what it was about. And as I was talking to her, I said, I know what you did for work in Korea and there's nothing that you need to be ashamed of and I'm not ashamed of you. And so I think that there's, you know, I think that when you can confront these secrets that are really frightening because you're, you, you fear the rejection of the person who's going to know about the secret. Um, if you can do it in a way that, you know, sort of from the beginning communicates that you're not going to reject the other person, um, it makes it makes that conversation a lot easier. And I kind of feel like writing is also a form of doing that, of that sort of communication. That's an invitation to say, you know, look, we share some things and I understand some, we understand some things about each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that haunting that you mention across generations, I feel like um, it is actually throughout the diaspora as well. In that first book, Haunting the Korean Diaspora, it examines how Korean diaspora writers engage with information that's uh, unveiled on the peninsula. Um, for example, you find that after the first Korean comfort woman, Wiyambu, tells her story publicly in 1991 on the Korean peninsula, diaspora writers in the U.S. start to create scholarship and art about the comfort women. And so what do you think or what do you believe is unearthed in diaspora consciousness that compels us to respond intellectually and emotionally to history like the Wiyambu's, which was previously shrouded in shame? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think it's just sort of a continuation of the what you know what I was saying with the previous question um, is that I think that we carry those ghosts with us. You know, if it's something that the, our parents' generation can't talk about, it lives within us whether or not we know it. And so I think at the moment of breaking the silence, um, when there's a public, you know, that was a public staging of words of sort of releasing this this ghost into the public, um, that I think that it sort of unlocks something in the collective unconscious that it, you know, now it's time to begin excavating, excavating all of these things that have been, been buried. Um, and I think it's a long process and a collective process. Yeah, and even though your first book centers on those questions of haunting, um, you were initially scorned for your research questions about ghosts and and um, generational haunting. So what were the challenges of exploring your mother's life through an academic lens? And how did writing your second book, the memoir, Tastes Like War, which is so intimate and personal, present a different opportunity to tell her story? Yeah, I mean, my first book started when I was a doctoral student in sociology in a department that was, um, you know, very empirical, um, where most of the senior faculty were white men. And so when I was presenting my, um, my dissertation proposal, they all, they all thought that I was crazy, you know, like, who, who is this person who's talking about ghosts, you know, which, it, and it also made me think like, they don't know anything about Asian American studies, if they think that this is not um, legitimate scholarship. Um, and so I came up against institutional barriers with the first book, but also just sort of the the demoralization of trying to do it within like Western social science that sort of disregards um, anything that's irrational, right? Like voices, haunting, ghosts, spirit, the spirit world, like all of these things were sort of not taken seriously. But for me, it the, all of those things have been, um, I guess, my main source of inspiration and, and curiosity. Um, and as far as the the memoir, um, you know, that was, it gave me the opportunity to really center love, you know, in the, the writing of it and the thinking about it, because I knew that this was not an academic book. I didn't need to get anybody's approval for writing it. And so I, you know, I, the, I think that the main emotion driving my first book was probably anger. And this, with the second book, it was love. Yeah, and um, it's interesting seeing the questions that you bring to each book projects kind of shift throughout the the 
you know, the extent of the book. And I'm sure you started each of your book projects with the set of questions that you had about yourself, your family, and your mother. And so I'm curious, by the time that you finished each project, what new questions were you left with? So it's interesting because I don't know that I did necessarily start with a set of questions because I'm not that, you know, like I'm not the kind of writer who sort of plans things out. I just sort of figure it out as I write. Um, but my, you know, like my, my mom actually died during the production of the first book. And so that immediately sort of led to the second one. I mean, I didn't know that I was going to write a memoir at first. It was just that after my mom died, I had all of these memories of her before she had schizophrenia, uh, you know, like in, in Taste Like War, I described that as my first mother, right? And food was just, you know, it was like in every single memory and scene that came back to me. And so I started writing them down um, just so that I wouldn't forget them again. And so I think the, the set of questions around food sort of just emerged from just from my own observations of my memories. Um, and that I had called it in the prologue, I said that this was a borrowing a phrase from Maggie Nelson, an unintended sequel to my first book. But w once I finished this book, you know, like over the last few years, I've been I've been researching all of the massacres that have been uncovered in South Korea over the last 20 years or so. Um, and I feel like the third book is yet another, you know, sort of organic outgrowth of my previous work and so now I'm sort of thinking about them as a like as a trilogy I, you know I kind of feel like all all writing is just like one long project and that the questions just keep emerging the more you do it so um you know so it, it you know I, di I don't necessarily start with a set of questions I just sort of see what what comes out through the process of research and writing yeah and and um in the conversation we had before this talk, you also spoke about grief as a motivating force for um, whether it's writing or for building community um, or collective consciousness. And can I ask you about the role of grief in your writing and, and research? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that's the driving force, you know, is like grieving, you know, with Taste Like War, it was very in, in a very immediate raw grief of losing my mother and then recovering the memories of her. Um, but then there's also the grief around the histories that we're not allowed to know. And, you know, I think like when Kathy introduced um, the, introduced uh, Korea Peace Now and w mentioned that one of the goals is narrative change. Um, I think that for me, it is my grief that drives my um, my wish to change the narrative around what the Korean War was and what it still is, you know, because I think there are so many people who have not been allowed to grieve their losses or even or name their losses, um, you know, and I think even in the most literal way, when we think about all the all of the massacres that all that in the anti communist violence that that happened in South Korea that the, the families um, of, of the victims, they were, were not allowed to grieve because grieve, openly grieving somebody who had been you know, accused of being a communist could get the rest of your family killed. You know? um, and so I think that grief can both be a generative force, but it's also something that we need to demand that we have space for. You know? So I guess I, I was thinking more about what healing is because we, we had also talked about this in our, you know, pre-event meeting, that there's sort of a pop cultural notion that healing is, you know, being free of pain um, or being happy, you know, but I don't think of it that way whatsoever. And I think if I were to define healing, I would say that it is, it, you know, it's a condition in which you can make space for grieving. Right. And so when you're when you're constantly pushing it down, that's a, that's a pathological social condition, um, whether it is from, you know, and I think of both South Korea and the U.S., like in the example that I gave in South Korea, where it was um, literally illegal to grieve somebody who had been lost to anti-communist violence or, you know, here in the U.S., we have this other narrative about what the Korean War was. It doesn't even allow us to even ask the right questions. Um, but I think also in terms of our, you know, 
our culture being very grief averse. Um, there's just not a lot of space for it. And so I think with healing, you know, I'm, I I'm not as interested in personal healing as I am interpersonal, intercultural and social healing, um, because I think we have a lot of various sicknesses in our societies. Thank you, Grace. Yeah, and the last question that I have for you before I hand it over to Kathy is um, about the role that food can play in processing our collective grief. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, the senpechike that your mother asked for before she passed um, and the personal cult cultural significance that that dish held and how your mother unveiled stories from her life during these weekend meals that you made for her. Um, and so at what point in your memoir process, did you realize that food writing would be the vehicle for the book? And also um, part two of that question is how does recalling food memories allow us to share these difficult stories intergenerationally? Mm -hmm. um, well, for the first question, I, I think I sort of answered it already. It was like, you know, right after my mom died, all these memories came back and I noticed that food was in every single one of them. And so then I started to think more consciously about what the role of food was in, in our life together, you know, um, how it was, you know, I thought about food in relation to survival, um, not just like her experience of survival during the war, because she had told me a couple of stories about that, but also surviving being an immigrant in a xenophobic small town in America, um, that food played a really important role there. Um, and then from the, you know, the last excerpt that I read, um, the way that food can also sort of create you know, if the memories associated with that food are comforting and safe, that it can create a space where in which you feel like you can have a real conversation, you know, so it's the way I phrased it was that it sort of gently released the past. Um, you know, and I was also thinking about, um, so I, I was a discussant for Margaret Juhay Lee's book, Starry Field at the Korea Society last year. And she said something really interesting about interviewing people in her family who didn't want to talk, um, that she always started with like food, starting to talk about the food as a way of like getting people sort of situated and feeling comfortable, right? That you don't just go right in with the uncomfortable questions or ask people to reveal their deepest secrets. Um, but, you know, you, you sort of build a sense of trust um, through through the sharing of food. Thank you. That's a, yeah, that's a great strategy. I'll need to think about that when I continue interviewing my family members. Um, Kathy, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Grace. Thank you, Iris. 